If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, I want to invite you to join me in the book of 1 Samuel. And you might be asking the question, well, where in the world is 1 Samuel? That is in the Old Testament. If you go to the beginning of your Bible and then work your way back to the right, eventually you will run into the book of 1 Samuel. And I want to encourage you to, to get used to me saying that, because we are starting a new series today in this awesome little book. Well, little book, it's really, really a large book. But we are starting a new series in this book, and it's going to take us around 45 weeks or so to work through this incredible book. For those of you who know me, I preach the Word of God expositionally. That's, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, working our way through an entire book of the Bible. So I want to encourage you to take your little, that little, what's it, that little string thing that you might have in your Bible or a bookmark or, or something like that and to mark your place there because we're going to be going there a lot in the coming, the coming weeks. But what we're going to do today is we are simply going to do an overview of the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to highlight six theological points that really stand out in this book, and then starting next week, we're going to be really getting into every single you know, word and, and verse and chapter of this book. But today is simply going to be an overview of the book of First Samuel. And before we do that, before we look at these six theological themes that stand out in the book of First Samuel, I want us to do this. I want us to do something that we don't do that often, and I want us to watch a video. This video is around seven minutes long, and it gives us a great picture, a great summary of the book of 1 Samuel. So take a look at this video with me. That gives us just a great overview of the book of 1 Samuel. And just by um, a plug for that website, it's called thebibleproject.com. If you would like to ever know about you know, overviews or themes of books of the Bible, go to that website and you can watch videos like that video over all of the books of the Bible. It's a great, great resource. But what I want to do in these next few moments is I want us to look at six theological themes that stand out in this wonderful book. And these come from John MacArthur and Robert Bergen. And the first one is this. We see the sovereignty of God play out in the book of First Samuel. The sovereignty of God. If you remember, in the book of First Samuel, there is a lady by the name of Hannah. And for some reason, God, as the scriptures tell us, God had closed, closed her womb. And she goes before the throne of God and she asks God to open up her womb. And we read, we read her prayer right here in 1 Samuel chapter 1 where she prayed, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And then verse 20 says, And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have, I have asked, the Lord, asked him from the Lord. So we see the sovereignty of our God working out in the life of Hannah. For some reason, God had closed her womb. She goes before the throne of God and asks her to give her a child. And therefore, we see Samuel come forth from Hannah. We also see the sovereignty of God working in King David's life. If you remember, David, he was anointed as the king over Israel because of Saul's sin. And Saul becomes very, very jealous of David, and, and over and over and over, Saul tries to take the life of David, and David ends up becoming king over Israel after these many attempts from Saul to take his life. And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 24, Saul saying, after these many attempts to try and kill David, to, to try and take his life, Saul saying, and now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. So we see the sovereignty of God working out in this incredible letter. We need to understand that, that God is in charge of all that is going on in this wonderful book. And it's a great reminder for us today, church family, that our God is sovereign. 
It's a great reminder for us today, church family, that our God is in control. If you've noticed, outside in our world, our world has gone a little bit chaotic, a little bit crazy. But can I remind us today, church family, that our God is in control. He, he is on his throne. He has not surrendered his authority. Nothing can stop the plan of our God. He is sovereign. So what does that mean for us today? Well, just this great reminder that our God is sovereign. It reminds us today, church family, that we can trust our God. Whatever you're facing today, whatever you're going through, whatever may be on your horizon tomorrow, can I remind you today, church family, that you can trust our God. We can believe what he says in his word. His words are true. His words are trustworthy. If he says it in his word, it's going to come to pass. We can trust our God. We can trust his word. And also, we can rest in his sovereignty. We can rest in his plan for our lives. And I believe that there's many of you in this room today that just simply need to be reminded that God is in control. That God is in control of your situation. As he was in control of what was going on with Hannah, as he was in control as to what was going on with King David as well, keeping him alive for his promised kingship over Israel, God is in control of what you're facing today. He is sovereign over that. So we see the sovereignty of God working out in this book, and we'll see that played out in the coming weeks as we work our way through this book. We also see this. We also see the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of 1 Samuel. And again, we'll see that played out in the coming weeks as well, the work of the Holy Spirit. We see that the Spirit of the Lord came upon both Saul and David after their anointing as king. When they, that Saul and Samuel, came to Gibeah, Behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, that's Saul, and he prophesied among them. 1 Samuel 16 of King David, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that's King David, in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit playing out in this book as well. In the Old Testament, God would often pour out his spirit to empower people for his service. And in the New Testament, the spirit of God draws people to salvation. And then the spirit of God comes to dwell inside the people of God whenever they trust in Christ for salvation. So we need to see this morning that the same spirit that was evident in the book of 1 Samuel is the exact same Spirit of God who is dwelling inside the people of God today, convicting His people of sin, giving the people of God the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The Spirit of God, it teaches us the Spirit of God, he, he guides us. The Spirit of God gives us wisdom. The Spirit of God gives us revelation. The Spirit of God gives us power. The Spirit of God gives believers gifts, as in gifts of the Spirit, to be used for the glory of God. The Word of God also tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers and helps them in their weaknesses. And you and I, we receive the Spirit of God to dwell inside of us, whenever we trust in Christ for salvation. So we see the, the work of the Holy Spirit in this book. And the work of the Holy Spirit is working inside of the people of God today, the exact same Spirit. So we see the sovereignty of God. We'll see the work of the Holy Spirit in this book in the coming weeks. We'll also see the presence of God, the presence of God in the book of 1 Samuel in the coming weeks. The text tells us that the Lord was with Samuel. The Lord was with Samuel, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. We'll also see that the Lord was with King David. Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. For Samuel 18, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul, 1 Samuel 18, 14. And Samuel had success in all his undertakings. Why? For the Lord was with him. 
1 Samuel 18, Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David. We'll also see in the book of 1 Samuel that the Lord's presence was with the Ark of the Covenant. So we see this theme that the Lord was with his people and the same God who was present with the people of the Old Testament is the same God who is present with you today. That should encourage us today. The same God who was with King David, the same God who was with Samuel, the same God who was with the prophets of the Old Testament. He is near you today. He is with you today. The Bible tells us that our God is omnipresent. It tells us that he will never, ever leave you. He will never, ever forsake you. Whatever you're facing today, please understand that our God is right there with you. And you might be saying to yourself, or you might be saying to me, well, Caleb, I I haven't seen him work, or, or I haven't felt his presence, but can I just remind you today that he's with you, that he's walking alongside you, that he's going before you and behind you and beside you and above you and below you. He is fighting for you. He is with his children. He's for you. What does that mean for you today? That that means as well, as you can rest in the sovereignty of God, as you can rest in his great plan, you can rest today in his presence. He's with you. He'll be with you tomorrow in your job. He'll be with you tomorrow in your home. In, your, in the doctor's office, and whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, he is walking with you. Our God is omnipresent. He is for you. He is for his people. So we see the presence of God played out. We also see this in the book of 1 Samuel, and we'll see this played out in the coming weeks. We see the demand for wholehearted obedience to God. The demand for wholehearted obedience to God. Look at these verses that highlight this Great theological theme. Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the ashtoreth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Again, serve him only. This demand for wholehearted obedience from the children of God. 1 Samuel 15, and Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Again, demand for wholehearted obedience unto God. 1 Samuel 12, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. And we see all throughout the word of God that whenever the people of God obeyed God, whenever they followed him wholeheartedly, what happens? God takes care of his people. God provides for his people. God blesses his people. And the opposite is true as well. Whenever the people of God disobeyed God, We see over and over in the word of God that God brought judgment upon their lives. And you see, church family, this is a great reminder for us today as we are looking at these major theological themes in this book and also in the weeks to come that the same type of obedience that God commanded in the Old Testament is the same type of obedience that God commands of us today. We say we're followers of Christ. Well, God calls his children to do what his word says. God calls his children to live out his word. Even if it's difficult, even if it goes against culture, even if it goes against the ways of the world, and I'm just telling you, this book over and over and over and over, it's, it goes against culture. It will go against how you feel as well. But guess what? God calls us to live it out. He calls us to obey him. So we see this this demand for wholehearted obedience in the book of 1 Samuel. And God calls us to the exact same thing today. He calls us to follow him with all of our heart, with all of our minds, with all of our soul, with everything that we have. And can I just remind us today, church family, that it's worth it. You hear me say that a lot, but it is worth it. It's worth following Jesus. He is so worth it. He is so, he's so worthy. I get it. There are times where this word is difficult to live out in your homes, in your workplaces, students, in your schools, in your your activities, in your social clubs. I completely understand that. There are times where your flesh goes against this word, but it's so worth it. God blesses his people whenever they follow him wholeheartedly. You'll never regret it. 
You'll never regret following the Lord wholeheartedly. It is so worth it. Jesus is so worth it. So again, we see this this demand for wholehearted obedience to God. And again, we'll see this played out in the coming weeks as we start our way through this book. We also see this in the book of 1 Samuel, and this video highlighted this as well. We see the personal and national effects of sin. The book of Samuel demonstrates the personal and national effects of sin. We see this, that the sins of Eli and his sons resulted in their deaths. And we'll read about that in the weeks to come. 1 Samuel 2, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. We read more about Eli and his sons. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. That was because of their sin, because of their disobedience. We read more about this in 1 Samuel 3. Speaking of Eli, God said, And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. And we'll see in this text that Eli and his two sons go on to die because of their sin. They go on to die because of their disobedience. We'll also see in this text that Saul's disobedience resulted in the Lord's judgment And he was rejected as king over Israel. You remember, Saul was made king. But then Saul entered into a life of disobedience and sin. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But because of your sin, because of your disobedience, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. He's talking about King David, who would eventually come on the scene. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And we'll see in this book in the coming weeks that Saul, he ends up dying. He was once the king over Israel, but he ends up dying because of his sin, because of his disobedience to God. And this is a great reminder for us today, church family, that sin never works out. In the moment, sure, sin feels right. It it feels good. But whenever it goes against the word of God, it never works out. So this is a great reminder for us today, church family, that if if there is a, a sin in your life that you are flirting with, that you are winking at, that you are toying around with, that you are playing around with. This is a great reminder for us today, church family, to battle against that sin, to deal with that sin, to to repent of that sin, to turn your back on that sin, to go before the throne of God and to, to confess that sin to him and he will forgive you of that sin. If that is a sin that you are just dealing with over and over, that's going before the throne of God and saying, God, help me with this sin, help me to deal with this sin. Can I just tell you today, church family, that you cannot deal with sin in your own power. You cannot. You cannot deal with sin on your own power. The only way that you can handle sin is by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. It's by an utter dependence on the the power of the Spirit dwelling inside of you. It's a great reminder for us today, church family, that sin affects everything. It will destroy you, your family, The world that you are involved in and lived in, your sphere of influence, sin, it never works out, never pays off. Again, this book will teach us in the coming weeks that we need to deal with our sin. There is great effects, great effects to not dealing with our sin. And lastly, we'll see this major theme in the book of Samuel, and it's this. And I think, to me, this is the most exciting one. These are all incredible 
Theological themes. To me, this is the most exciting one, and I'll explain it. It's this. It's the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. You might be saying, what in the world is that all about? That's a big old word, Caleb. Well, let me explain what the Davidic covenant is. The Davidic covenant is God's promise to David that the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from the lineage of David. You see, 1 Samuel, the story of King David in, in both of these books, 1 Samuel and also 2 Samuel, what does this do for us? Ultimately, this great book will point us to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what it's leading to. It's leading to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's really awesome to see that 1 and 2 Samuel are framed by two references to the anointed king in the prayer of Hannah and also in the song of David. At the very beginning of 1 Samuel and at the end of 2 Samuel, here are these verses. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. This is Hannah praying. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Who is his anointed? That's Jesus Christ. This is a reference to the coming Son of God, Jesus Christ. This is prophesying about him. So that was at the very beginning of 1 Samuel. This is at the end of 2 Samuel, King David's song. He sang great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. That's talking about the Son of God. That's talking about the coming Messiah. His offspring forever is talking about Jesus Christ. These are two references that bookend the very beginning of 1 Samuel to the end of 2 Samuel that, that are talking about the coming Messiah. You see, according to the Lord's promise, Jesus will come through the lineage of David. Hear this. Great covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Who's God talking about there to King David? He's talking about Jesus Christ talking about the Messiah, the coming Son of God. You see, without this story, without, without King David, we do not get Jesus Christ. That should excite us today. This book is going to point us to salvation. It's going to point us to the gospel. It's going to point us to Jesus Christ. Without David, we do not get the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ, church family, we do not have salvation. Without Jesus Christ, we have no way for our sin to be forgiven. You see, 1 Samuel, it ultimately points us to Jesus Christ. Also, something that reminds us of Jesus Christ is communion. I want to invite you this morning to take out these little cups. The way that we're having to do communion these days is a little bit different. Historically, we would, we would pass a plate that would have these elements in them, the bread and also the juice. But today, as we are kicking off this, this new book, it's going to take us some 40 plus weeks to, to work through, as we're going to ultimately see the Son of God, King Jesus, revealed in this book. What I want us to do today is I want us to just to stop. I want us to stop and remember what 1 Samuel is pointing us to. It's pointing us to Jesus. Ultimately, it's pointing us to his death, to his sacrifice on the cross. I want to ask that you guys will go ahead and bring the lights down just a little bit. And I just want to, just to remind us in these next few moments as to what communion is. Of course, communion, it reminds us of the Son of God. As this book, in the, in the coming weeks, you're going, going to ultimately reveal to us Jesus Christ, communion, it reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of what Jesus Christ came to this earth for, why he was born, why he lived a perfect and a sinless life, and why he died on a cross for the sacrifice of our sin. But I want to remind us of some things before we take 
of this incredible ordinance. And I want to remind us as well that this ordinance that we are partaking in, this is a command from Christ. He commands his church to do this. Jesus Christ himself, he instituted this. So this is coming from Jesus himself. But I want to remind us of just a few things. The first one is this, is that communion is for believers in Jesus Christ. It's for his followers. You see, whenever Jesus Christ instituted this, whenever he instituted this ordinance for the church, it was among his disciples. It was among followers of his. Whenever Paul is talking about communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's speaking about communion to the church, to a body of Christ, to a body of believers. So this is for the church. It's for believers in Jesus Christ. And I want to say some things about this. Number one is this, is that communion should be taken in repentance. The Bible tells us this. Paul says, For whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself that's, ask, that's, that's looking within, asking God to search your heart. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Verse 29, for whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So before we partake in this symbolic but holy and incredible act, we have to ask the Lord to search our hearts. And if there is sin in our life, the Bible tells us this, that we cannot partake in this until we have made that sin right with God, until we have confessed that sin. But hear this today, church family, that the Bible makes it so clear that whenever we confess our sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us for, from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that he takes our sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west. It's a, it's a time where we can simply come clean before our God. So, so, so communion is for believers. It should be taken in repentance as well. Communion should be taken in remembrance. As this book, 1 Samuel, is going to point us to Jesus, communion should be taken in remembrance. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 25. Paul says, this cup is the new, sorry, Jesus said this. Paul's quoting Jesus. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So communion should be taken in remembrance. What are we remembering whenever we are partaking in this ordinance instituted by Christ? We're remembering his body that was broken for our sin. We're remembering his blood that was shed for our sin. That's why it's for believers. We're remembering what he has done for us on the cross. So communion, it's taken in repentance. It's taken in remember, remembrance. Communion as well should be taken independence. What are we saying whenever we're taking communion? We're saying this, that we are depending on the shed blood of Jesus Christ, on the broken body of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. You see, you cannot earn your forgiveness. You cannot buy your forgiveness. You can't do enough good things for your forgiveness. The only way that we can have forgiveness for our sin and have the hope of eternal life is by utter dependence on Jesus Christ. It's by placing our faith and our trust in his work on the cross. So that's what we're saying whenever we're taking communion, that we are dependent on his shed blood, that we are dependent on his broken body for our sin, the work of the, on the cross. And lastly, we see that communion should be taken with expectance. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, communion should be taken with expectance. What are we expecting? We're expecting this, church family, that at any moment, Christ could return for his church. He could return for his people. The word of God tells us that, that soon he is going to return for his church. And that's what Jesus says. Every time that you partake in this element, let it remind you that one day I'm going to return for you. One day I'm returning for the church. You may have noticed that our children were brought back in. I think this is a great teaching element and a great teaching time for our children. Your children may not yet be followers of Christ, but this is a, an incredible way for you to be able to illustrate to your children as to what these elements stand for. 
The bread stands for the broken body of Christ. The blood stands for, or the, the drink stands for the blood of Christ that was shed for us. So before we take of these elements, I just want to invite you to bow your heads. Maybe you're in this place today and you're not yet a follower of Christ, but you're considering that, or maybe you're confused or you're wondering if you are. Can I just tell you what the Bible says about how we can become followers of Jesus Christ and why we should? The Bible tells us this in Romans 6, that we've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, 1 John says this, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Romans 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And this morning, whether you're watching online or you're with us in this place, today you can call on the name of Jesus Christ to save you. You can pray a prayer like this from the depths of your heart. God, I recognize that I've sinned. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I confess that he is Lord. He is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And I commit my life to follow him from this point forward. And this morning, if you said that to God and meant that from the depths of your heart, I would encourage you to partake in this element. And if you did say that this morning and meant that from the depths of your heart, the Bible calls you a Christian. I would, I would encourage you, you as well to tell somebody, to tell me, to tell Tyson, to tell somebody in this church so that we can help you with the next steps. The Bible also tells us this, that communion should be taken in repentance. I just want to invite you these next few moments just to allow God to search your heart. Allow God to search your heart. Is there any sin in your life that you need to confess to God? I know the Lord has revealed things in my life that I need to confess. Maybe it's a sin of thought, something you've been thinking that you shouldn't. Maybe it's an attitude that you've had that you know that you is not of God. Maybe it's some things that you've said that are not honoring unto God. Maybe you're holding a grudge of some sort against somebody. Confess that today. Maybe there's something that you've done that you've not repented of that you need to repent of. Repent of that to God right now. He forgives you. Maybe God's told you to do something and you haven't done it. That's called the sin of omission. Repent of that right now. Maybe you've been depending on yourself. It's called the sin of self-rule and self-reliance instead of following God in His ways. Confess that to God today and tell Him that you're depending on Him and you're following Him fully. If the Lord just reveals anything to you, would you confess that to God? And know that, that if He does... It's a good thing because he's speaking to you. He wants you to make it right with him today. And he loves you. He forgives your sin through Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for your forgiveness. As we come to this element this time where we partake in these elements today, God, we just thank you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven. We have the hope of eternal life. Thank you so much for your grace, God, in our lives. Whenever we mess up, you pick us up and you hold us and you forgive us and you dust us off. You're a good God. Thank you so much for your grace, Lord. So today as we partake in this the sacred act that Jesus Christ himself instituted, we remember what he has done for us. His body broken, his blood shed. We say today that we depend on Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Thank you so much for the fact that we will see Jesus revealed in this book of 1 Samuel in the coming weeks. And we depend on him, his shed blood for forgiveness, his broken body. Without him, we would have no way. And God, these elements as well remind us that one day our, our Savior is going to return. So we expect one day that he's going to return. And Father, in the meantime, help us, Lord, to live for the glory and the honor and the praise of your name, following you wholly with a wholehearted obedience. We love you, God. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you to peel back the top of this portable 
communion cup. I'm going to invite you just to hold the bread in your hand as I read this verse. And then after I read the verse, we'll partake in the bread together. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We invite you to slowly, slowly peel back the top of the grape juice. I want to read one more verse. And then after I read this verse, we're going to partake of the juice that reminds us of the blood of Christ that was shed for us. And after we partake in this, we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to worship our Savior. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to worship the Son of God for what he has done for us. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church family, would you stand to your feet as we worship our Savior? Let's sing to him. Let's give him honor and praise and glory.